Real quick, It's What's Inside is finally on Netflix. This is one of my favorite movies out of Sundance and South by Southwest. I recommend watching it with at least one other person, but super fun thriller with great editing. Check it out now. All right, pals, today we're talking Speak No Evil, the latest remake by Blumhouse, and finally what I would consider to be a win for the studio after a year of some of the most bland and boring horror movies I've had to subject myself to. But to notch that win down just a little bit, they did have an entire blueprint to work with from the original 2022 movie that was Danish. And other than the many moments that are almost shot for shot remakes, these are very different movies, particularly in how they execute their conclusions. But there's no denying that it's easier to add your own flair to something that's already been done than, you know, pull something new out of your butt. Like they fumbled the killer pool. I don't even, I don't even know what to say. Don't even get me started on imaginary. Now these remakes can usually be pretty bad to put it lightly. A lot of the times they just pull out everything that made the original version special. Sometimes it's a lot of cultural aspects that end up missing, different regional behaviors. And with this one in particular, so much of that movie is already in English because it's like the common language between the two families. So it kind of felt even more unnecessary than usual. And while I will say that the remake switches things up in its finale that like kind of widely changes what the original was intending to convey, they at least did it in an entertaining way. And I do still think you get the purpose of what the story is going for. They just go in a very different direction for the ending. As a late setup for both of these movies, two families meet while on vacation in Italy when one of the families invites the other out to their remote countryside home, things progressively get more tense as boundaries and comfort levels are pushed. The original is very much a commentary on the degree that Nordic culture stresses social conventions and a tendency to suppress feelings a lot more than what is common in the West. But a lot of those societal mannerisms to avoid being rude or making other people uncomfortable, even when they're making you uncomfortable, can feel pretty universal to a lot of people. So many people end up in bad situations because they're trying not to be rude and they don't want to make other people feel awkward and the worst people will take advantage of that. And I think that's why so much of this remake still holds up, even if the original is supposed to be a commentary on a specific section of the world's culture. I know it's easy to look at this and be like, well, I'd never end up in that situation and a lot of people wouldn't, but a lot of people would. And if you just kind of take that Danish family as a representation of a wider cultural issue, it makes a lot more sense. I know that's still gonna infuriate a lot of people. There's some very mixed thoughts on how this movie plays out, but I like both of them. I will say the original is a hell of a lot more brutal. When I found out they were doing the remake, I was really wondering if they were gonna like push the boundaries in, in that way, but no, they clearly wanted to make the more like American solid theatrical run movie. Like I know it's rated R in the States, but in Canada it was 14A, meaning any high schooler could just wander into that after school. I was expecting it to have a little bit more bite in certain areas because it was uh, adapted and directed by James Watkins, but I, I still feel pretty satisfied with it. So we'll be going through both movies, mostly using this remake kind of as the rubric to go along and then just saying where the original differs, uh, what excels in each versions, what is very much the same, what is very different, and right down into those horrific conclusions. <laughs> But just a reminder before we start, this is why we don't visit people in remote areas with no cell phone service when we've met them like one time. This is why I don't talk to people when I go places. I just make sure I always have today's sponsor Surfshark on deck to access all my favorite streaming services so I don't have to. Because who needs conversation when I have movies? Surfshark VPN lets you connect to any one of their thousands of different server locations around the world so your internet thinks you're in that location. I'm currently visiting my parents so I don't have access to all my movies, but I wanted to rewatch the original Speak No Evil after watching the remake, but it wasn't available on Netflix in Canada. So after a quick trip to unogs.com, I found out it was on Thai Netflix, quickly connected to that server, and I was good to go. Surfshark is my go-to for accessing streaming services while I'm traveling, taking advantage of all my YouTube premium benefits, which I found out don't work in some countries, and keeping me more secure on public Wi-Fi. But really, so much of it is the movies. I once again must remind everybody that I used to be funny is on US Netflix, and I strongly recommend it. So try out Surfshark for yourself. It's fast, secure, blocks and one, and ads is available across unlimited devices. And if you sign up today by going to surfshark.com slash Jedi, you can get four additional months completely free. Now, Speak No Evil works so well as a concept because there are very few things more effective than a well-executed social thriller. Taking a situation that so many people could find themselves in to some degree and then pushing it to the extreme by playing on behaviors that so many of us unintentionally fall into. I think I would have avoided this because while I do hate feeling awkward and making other people feel awkward in situations, I also hate having conversations 
conversations with people I don't know very well, so I would have just extricated myself from all of this, and I have no problem just evaporating in the middle of the night. So watching this movie, obviously a lot of people are like, holy shit, why are you doing this? Why are you letting this happen? Which is fair, but I at least find that they're entertaining enough to make up for any of those issues. But let's dive in. So while a lot of that dialogue early on is pretty similar to identical for large sections of this buildup, I do think the remake does a better job with the tension building, and maybe that's actually a point against it. Like, even if you walk into the movie knowing that something's gonna be weird with this family, it's almost too obvious that there's something kind of wrong with them. Whereas in the original, I find that some of, like, the biggest ominous music plays when they're just, like, alone together as a couple, so it's almost like they're just ignoring the things that are already wrong in their lives. And on top of that, I find that the remake fleshes out their backstories a lot more. Unlike the original, where the main family is Danish and people they meet are Dutch, they're from America, living in London because Ben was supposed to open a London branch of his company before the economy tanked, and they just decided to stay for some reason. And she seemed to be a really successful PR person, but isn't really doing much because she doesn't have like the same connections in England. So they're just like vibing here because he likes having access to Europe? But my guy, if you'd moved for a job that didn't happen and you still don't have a replacement job, maybe you don't stay in one of the most expensive cities in the entire world and continue to take Italian vacations. Because yeah, it's clearly causing her a lot of stress. And instead of Dutch, the family they meet are West Country Brits. You get a bit of poo on your finger. Patrick is a doctor, but he quit his practice to do some occasional work with Doctors Without Borders and Kira just tends to the home. But I must point out that she's played by Ashling Franchosi, sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, of The Nightingale, which remains to be one of the hardest movies I've ever had to watch in a theater setting. I saw someone almost go over the balcony trying to get out of the theater. Very intense. <laughs> but they have a son named Abel or Ant who has an issue with his tongue that makes it near impossible to speak. And the main family has a daughter named Agnes who is overly attached to a stuffed rabbit, so you know that's gonna cause an issue. I find the remake really amps it up, like she has full-on panic attacks where she scratches at her arms if he's not with her uh, to really just stress that fact. And the dynamic shift here is really interesting because in the original, them having different native languages means that there are moments where Patrick and Karen were talking to each other that uh, we didn't understand, or at least the people who don't speak Dutch didn't understand. So there's this fun little play where the Danish family is like, oh, I actually find there's a lot of similarities between the Danes and the Dutch, and that kind of makes everything else that happens in, in the movie uh, quite interesting. Now, one of the main differences I noticed just in general energy and behavior was from Louise in particular. In the remake, James McAvoy's behavior as Patrick is a lot more instantly unsettling, especially for Louise, so it immediately stands out as, oh, they feel awkward, they're trying not to be rude, even if some of their boundaries are being pushed. Uh, do you have helmets? I won't call the fun police if you don't. But those mild eccentricities actually work to their favor sometimes. Like, they don't know how to avoid this Danish couple that won't stop talking to them about the cooking classes, and Patrick's more intense personality works to dissuade them from hanging around. Though we did find it funny that they specify that this is a Danish couple because there was an annoying couple in the original movie, but it's because the original movie is Danish. In both, Ben and Bjorn are really drawn to Patrick and his general vibes, while with Louise, while both are a little bit neurotic on aspects of childcare, Mackenzie Davis is a lot less easygoing comparatively. Like, she visibly has more issues issues with Patrick's behavior, but not enough to completely disengage from them and definitely enjoys the company more than the Danes. But she's really not chill at all, though. You want a beer? It's a little early. Okay, I'm sorry, you're on vacation. You can drink whenever you want. This is why no one rooted for you in Happiest Season, Mackenzie. I'm so sorry, I love San Junipero. But after a pretty chill time in Italy, the Daltons head back to London with loose commitments of visiting their countryside home. But months later, when a postcard shows up with their group picture with the invite, Louise isn't so sure, but Ben really wants to go. In the remake, this is where we get the hints that there's some potential marriage issues here because she makes sure to show him her phone, so I'm guessing there might have been some infidelity issues, which may contribute to why she ends up agreeing to go, even though she originally really didn't want to, because Ben does, and she might be trying to make up for some behaviors. In the original, she just kind of shuts it down, but then when talking to friends at dinner, they're like, oh, it can't hurt to go. What's the worst that could happen, they say? Well, I bet we're gonna find out. And once they get to the secluded farmhouse, things are pretty weird. Aunt is almost completely closed off again, and even though they know Louise is a vegetarian. So, you're a vegetarian. But actually pescatarian, cause fuck them fish, right? Patrick killed their prize goose for the Dalton's arrival and wants Louise to have the prime first bite, and she actually does it? See, to me, this would have been the easiest thing to shut down. Like, if you haven't eaten meat in a while, it can cause some, like, massive stomach distress, so it's very easy to just be like, oh my god, I would, but it, it will actually make me sick. In the remake, she does spit it out, but it's really just 
step one in showing that their boundaries can be completely crossed. The unwashed sheets is something I probably uh, would not have said anything about and just like tried to subtly wash them the next day or something. But the first night also presents the first situation where I thought, oh, I don't know if that kid is theirs. He goes outside while Ben is taking out the trash and just opens his mouth wide, not saying anything, almost like he's just trying to show. And they've already been told that he has a smaller tongue because of a medical condition, but he's clearly trying to show him something. And in the original, it doesn't look like it's just smaller. It just looks like it's been removed. The remake just has it looking more stubby, but they've already primed me to think something's up with the kid because the opening of this remake movie is them driving through the back roads while the rear view mirror is just focused in on his face. Face. Ben just chalks this up as Ant trying to communicate and it just gets added to the list of uncomfortable things happening. Right along with him screaming at night. But I find that some cracks start to show more in Patrick's behavior, like he starts getting a bit more rough with Ant and it seems like he might be getting rough with Kira as well. They even get Ant to cliff jump when he can't swim. Can he swim? <laughs> yeah, 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 sink or swim. Don't worry, paddy has got him. Similar things happen in the original and it all just kind of seems like subtle ways for the kid to maybe show like, hey, they don't, they're not as nice as they seem originally, uh, but it could also just be to see how long it takes the Daltons to say something about the behavior, but there is genuine abuse happening. It's chilling in both, but I do find that McAvoy is really good at going back and forth between the like fun dad and the like, I don't want to play with you anymore energy with the kid. Show me love. The next boundary push is when they get invited to dinner at this local chef's place and they assume it'll be the full families, but the kids aren't invited. Literally at the last minute, they just leave their daughter with this man they don't know who doesn't speak English just because these people they barely know say it's fine. I know that my mom absolutely would not have left me there and they've definitely set up Louise, at least in the remake, to be the mom that wouldn't leave her there, but they do. Also, again, my mom just would have put her foot down on the entire weekend event, so I wouldn't have been in this weirdo situation at all. Now, I know it probably seems like I've been giving a little bit too much away with like what's going on with the kids, but it's kind of hard not to, especially when the remake really pushes to have them be more active participants in the story. So it becomes immediately obvious that the kid is trying to tell them that something's wrong. While playing hide and seek, Aunt takes Agnes to look at Patrick's watches and keeps trying to show her an inscription on the back of one. An inscription that has his name included, but isn't in English, so she doesn't understand. And you know what? I'm not going to get mad at the 11 year old for not getting context clues of the situation at hand, but it's obvious a lot earlier in the remake that that kid is not theirs. The original definitely feels like more of a build up to that reveal, but again, I just remember thinking that the tongue looked so obviously massacred that something more had to be going on with the kid, but not that it immediately had to be that he wasn't ever their son, uh, but it does make sense uh, in the remake that the kid would be trying to reach out for help more so than he was in the original original. Because later that night, he even shows her bruises, lighter burns, and other scars on his body to show that he's at least being seriously abused. But while all that's going on and they're playing hide and seek, the dinner is getting just as awkward. They do at least now prep for her being vegetarian or again, pescatarian, uh, and she gets called out on it being weird. That kind of pescatarianism is a privilege. It's complicated. Can we agree? Because it is kind of weird that if it's for ethical environmental reasons, you'd still be eating fish. You can just say like, oh, look, I'm not perfect. You know, I'm trying to work down to that. But it, it's kind of hard to argue that, you know, eating a goose that was raised on their farm and presumably and hopefully killed ethically in the long run would be better than eating any fish caught by modern methods. Unless you're catching the fish yourself, which I, I kind of doubt she's doing in London. Again, I agree that doing something is better than nothing when it comes to sustainability, but it is just the situation that he's trying to like push some buttons. And it gets kind of fun here because the more they try to stick to being polite and not kind of stepping out of bounds, Patrick's showing that he has no issues in stepping on those toes. Too many people these days are afraid of honest debate, aren't they? Mm. We're all too fucking polite. And while we as viewers know that something much more sinister is coming, so much of this movie really could just be about a guy who really likes to push boundaries and try to make people snap for their own betterment and not a sick game that it's gonna turn into. Everybody talking, but nobody being honest is left as impatient. But yeah, no, these people are just whack jobs. Like when talking about how they keep their sex life fresh enough to get it on the daily, Kira starts pretending to go down on Patrick under the table. And that's where I know I would have said something. Like, I get it's awkward, guys, and I get awkward freezing, but come on. Not that Louise didn't already make it more awkward when in response to them saying they get it on daily, she says, Oh, Ben's lucky if he gets it once a month. <laughs> what? Ma'am, a mismatched libido is fine, but like, don't do him like that in public. His 
name is Scoot. He doesn't need more heat. But we're gonna stick a pin on that comment because the implications there will get so much worse. Now, one thing they've added to the remake is that there's a pretty sizable age gap between Patty and Kira. There is also technically an age gap between Louise and Ben if you're going by their actual actor ages. But Patrick and Kira have been together for 17 years. Wow. You get less for murder. <laughs> Not specifically true, but interesting comment to make about your husband. And Louise makes a face at that and later wonders how young Kira must have been when they met. I know the actress herself is 31, so if they're going with that age range, range in mind she would have been like 13 to 15 when they got together so that's very fucked up if that's what we're working with age wise because you know pat's obviously would have been in his like late 20s at that time so that's also going to come back around but back to the awkward dinner kira follows up her little display by mentioning that they like to dine out sometimes to keep things fresh oh no not a country swipe swinger proposition in the original it definitely doesn't overtly go into a sex conversation but they do both start dancing and this is where you feel like there must be some kind of intimacy issue between Bjorn and Louise because the more handsy Patrick and Karen get, the less they can even dance and they just kind of stand awkwardly in front of each other like middle school kids. But both are topped off with Ben feeling like he has to pay for the entire bill. Just topping off a perfect night talking about fucking by getting fucked. Love that for him. Now after this, the original has a scene that I'm like really not a fan of. It's like this weird car ride home where Patrick's driving erratically to loud music and Louise literally starts to scream in the back seat for him to shut it off, which you think would like amount to more, but not immediately. Uh, she just ends up having sex with Bjorn after she's pretty sure that Patrick was in the bathroom while she showered. So that seemed just like a weird reaction to that, I guess, just trying to push that intimacy with him. The remake just cuts to them back at the house and they get into an argument about Louise's comments at dinner, which were extra fucked up because yes, she had been having an emotional affair with someone and that's why Ben's weird about her phone. And that just pushes into the general issues they've been having since his work in London fell apart and how she feels like she she gave up everything she had for him to be happy and pursue his dreams. And he's still just so angry that things aren't working out perfectly as they should. I don't know if you're with me because you love me or because you just can't stand to fail. And Patrick's watching this all go down from the stained glass door. Creepy, but less creepy than when Patrick in the original is watching them sex from the stained glass window. Whew, sorry, I had to switch locations. I found out that people at that other house were like <laughs> trying to take all my money. But later Louise goes to check on Agnes, finds her not there, and it's because she's in Patrick and Kira's bed. Which, totally inappropriate, they're in their undies. In the original, Patrick is butt fucking naked. For the remake, I'm surprised that the kid with all the anxiety issues was even able to fall asleep with strangers, uh, especially after she saw all the scars on Ant. But it's enough for Louise to make them leave in the middle of the night, which is when I realized they have a Tesla? They drove a Tesla to the deep English country? Where would they charge it? And to make it all worse, they realized that the kid forgot the damn stuffed bunny. We don't get hurt like Ant. Please calm down, okay? Do Breathe. That to Harvey. Agnes! Hey. Okay, if I pulled that shit, I absolutely never would have seen what I forgot ever again in my life and probably would have had all my other worldly possessions removed for quite some time. This is where most people start being like, what the hell are you guys doing? Because she starts having a total meltdown and he actually turns the car around. They never bother to push harder to see what she means about them hurting ants and that they're gonna do the same thing to the bunny, but that's fine. In the original, they at least set it up more so that like Bjorn feels like he's doing like a good act because when he was trying to find the rabbit in Italy, Patrick really plays up like, oh, you, you went off searching for that in, in a city you're not from all by yourself. That's like very heroic of you. So now he's got to be the hero in real time. That is one thing I say that there's like the, the solid through line between the two of them. You really get the impression that Ben and Bjorn like see Patrick as this like version of himself that he would like to be more like, just more confident and self-assured and having the ability to just say what you want. And at this point in both movies, they have no reason to think that anything deeper might be happening back at that house. But of course, Patrick's awake now and very upset that they tried to do a runner in the middle of the night, but it pushes them to finally air out some grievances. The biggest being Agnes in their bed, which uh, Patrick apparently didn't know about in the remake. They basically explain it away by saying that Kira lost a baby girl, so hearing Agnes's cries just made her want to help because Louise didn't come get her. The original doesn't really try to do the missing child thing, but it pushes it really far on the like, well, where were you? She was crying. Like, where were you knowing full well that they were going at it. But instead of leaving again like they should be doing, Ant really tries to be getting them to stay longer. <laughs> 
<laughs> What's he saying? I wanted to show you the chickens. But I'm sorry, at this point, there's literally no reason to be like, I'm so sorry, we really do have to go. Maybe next time, bye! But realizing that he's running out of time, Ant finally tries writing a note to show Agnes, but it's not in English, so she can't read it, and then he eats it before Kira can see what he did. Me being me immediately translated it, and it was something like, please help me escape, it's not safe here in Danish. So yeah, this poor little shit isn't their kid, doesn't speak English, and can't even if he could. And then when Agnes tries to tell her mom, she just thinks she's being mean to the kid with a disability, so that's great. Sometimes it's okay to think things, but you can't actually say them. Mom, look man, sometimes it's not trashing on a disability, there's actually something wrong. And then for some reason during this, Ben had agreed to go hunting with Patrick, which he absolutely cannot do. It's always been about a hunt, getting him in the crosshairs, luring the fish onto the hook. That's what I live for. Oh, I bet it is, buddy. I bet you got some real big suckers. But it's kind of a nice little moment, you know? Like, he helps Ben get out all those frustrations he's holding on to. He's making him feel like a million bucks. In the original, they even follow it up with a little bro pool time, not even five feet apart. Two bros chilling in the hot tub, five feet apart because they're not gay. But in the original, it is really this like big moment to, to stress how much they suppress things uh, as a culture and that he just doesn't know how to express his needs and any issues he's having at this point and it is just starting to consume him. Honestly, there's some really good therapy going on here if we just ignore the child abduction. Now when both Louise ends up cutting her finger and there's a moment where they're like, oh, Patrick, you're a doctor, come take a look. God, there's a doctor in the house. <sighs> I'm not a doctor. Oh, excuse me, what? Now the remake treats it as a fake out. Of course I'm a bloody doctor. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm not sure if he's not at all a doctor, maybe has some kind of doctor training, maybe just with animals because at some point they're gonna show that he has veterinary ketamine. But in the original, they literally just let Patrick get away with being like, oh yeah, when I meet new people, sometimes I get nervous and I, I want to impress them by lying. That's when it's probably time to go, but no. They will not. Things just have to keep escalating, like now Kira's trying to tell Agnes how to eat, leading to an awkward parenting conversation. Seems like they may be prepping for the day that they are in charge of Agnes. Which Patrick and Kira then just flip back on them when they start getting on Patrick's case for freaking out at Ant for not being able to follow a dance routine. No! Patty! Which, don't worry dude, like I can definitely hit all the beats, but I can't follow a routine to save my life. But it gets hostile enough that even Agnes is scared. One more time. Yeah. I, hear I hear you. I hear you. Dude, be better for your daughter. What the fuck? So that obviously all explodes and Louise wants to leave right away. But, you know, Ben here is just being wishy-washy about needing a coffee and making excuses for Patrick because he's drunk. So while he's making his coffee, Kira just begs them to wait until Patrick wakes up. Please don't leave before Paddy's up. He'll be so angry and it will be better for me. All but saying he's gonna take it out on me if you leave. So this is very specifically where the two movies veer off. So I'm just completely gonna go through this final act in the remake, then swing back around to tell you what happens in the original. So Ant takes this drunken opportunity to steal Patrick's keys and brings Agnes to a souvenir room filled with suitcases, cell phones, and other personal belongings and a photo album with a bunch of pictures of Patrick and Kira and families they've met on vacation. But in every picture, they have a different sad kid until it lands on a happy ant sticking his tongue out. Because those are his real parents that they killed and then cut his tongue out so he can't talk. With the ultimate plan being taking Agnes next. I'm surprised they didn't kind of like tease that a little bit earlier on with Patrick telling Ant not to bother the Danish couple when they're on vacation because that would have been a fun thing to, to look back on and be like, oh, that's why he specifically said not to be around them. But Agnes uses her phone to get evidence so now she can tell her mom what's up after pretending to get her first period, which quick thinking we love that. But sadly, even though we got the key back, Patty still seems to notice that the hideaway was disturbed, so their escape attempt just gets more awkward. Must have been a bit of a shock for you out there. Ooh, he knows, and then their tire is flat, but then he actually fixes it for them, so he's just definitely having fun toying with them. He also put Hoppy in the gutter, so Ben climbs up to get it, even though Agnes was actually cool, which is letting him stay. Yeah, it's a lot different when you realize you might have your tongue cut out, right, Agnes? And then Patrick just keeps pushing about honesty and about how they're lying about having them visit London, so Louise finally breaks, and while she's certainly still lying about why they're leaving, there might be some truth to this statement because she's clearly fed up and says that, yeah, he's right, they won't be in touch because she and Ben are probably getting divorced. Finally, we believe honesty is the first step to fixing things. 
It would be so funny if this was actually just some kind of like elaborate marriage counseling ruse. Like they just go around meeting couples on vacation that they can just tell like there's some tensions brewing underneath the surface and they're like, we're gonna, we're gonna force it out of them. We're gonna scare them straight. But when it looks like he's actually gonna let them go, he throws Ant into the lake. And this is where the shit sack finally decides to do something brave. He tells Louise to keep driving while he jumps out to save Ant, but Patty starts closing the gate before they can make it out. So now they're being held at gunpoint while Louise has to transfer their life savings. Please don't hurt my family. You don't even love him, mate. If you did, you'd have left him in the pond with his parents. It's kind of hard to disagree. It might have been a really brave moment, but you kind of screwed your family over in the process. Mike's already got a buyer for your car. Holy shit, he was arranging sales while they were still vibing in the house. So this leads to the best line of the movie, which does end up being way more chilling in the original. When Ben asks why they're doing this, the answer is simply... Because you let us. Now, just as he's about to prep Agnes for the tongue cutting with some ketamine, Louise slashes him in the face with the box cutter she found in the bathroom and gets the gun from Kira. I'm a victim here too. Please, Louise, I was his first. Yo, that really sucks because you were clearly a kid when it happened, but uh, you're not invited. It was her. The first one of the kid. Also, I probably would have at least shot Patrick before trying to escape. You can deal with the logistics after. So from here on out, it's just 20 minutes of them trying to escape. They can't drive away because that Mark guy blocks the road. <laughs> Wait, are Tesla's windows bulletproof? I know they were saying the Cybertruck was, but then they showed a rock break it, but I don't think the cars are. That's so funny. So back to the house they go, where Louise literally has to like brute force Ben to make it through the situation as they start trying to scare them out. Never forget this, Ben! Do you feel the shame? Ah, theatrical wacko. So the first plan is to Molotov cocktail Patrick's distillery to get attention, but it just hits the car, which does thankfully explode, but no one comes to help. Then Louise gets him in the face with drain cleaner after tricking him with the damn breathing app. Then right when it looks like Ben's actually going to be useful, Mark overpowers him, so Louise ends up having to kill him with a hammer. Mom mode in full effect, family fun for everyone. And she tops it all off by bashing Kira in the head with a brick before she can shoot them off the roof, but it's okay, guys. Ben's going to step up by jumping off the roof to put the ladder back up for them. Great job. You did it. A real hero. But then for some reason, he tells Agnes to go hide by the car when they don't have eyes on Patrick. You keep your kid by your side, sir. Because of course, when they turn around, he's got a gun to her head. So while they're begging him not to kill her, he says, oh, I'm not gonna kill her. She's all, I've got to take care of me now. Oh, ew. You're a woman now. Ew, ew, ew. Thankfully, all the girls in this family are badasses. So she jabs him with the ketamine he was gonna use on her. I was waiting for that to pop back up again. And then it looks like they're just gonna leave him there incapacitated, but Ant's not cool with that and bashes Patty in the face with a brick. One could say that Ben was being the bigger man by not shooting him, but no, this is better. With the final shot going back to the opening, not through his reflection, but just focused on Ant's face. Pretty solid and standard ending for a Hollywood thriller where the family fights back and makes it out, but with lots of trauma to go around. So how is the original so different? Well, it is deeply more disturbing and at times more frustrating frustrating in its attempt to maintain that through line of the because you let us. Instead of Abel showing Agnes the trophy room, Bjorn wakes up to the sound of the TV blaring after seeing a scuffle with Abel and Patrick in the hall. When he goes to check on the noise, he doesn't notice that Patrick is watching him from outside, but goes to see why the barn door is slamming in the wind, which leads him to all the suitcase and other personal items before hitting dozens of pictures of other families they've clearly killed before he stumbles on Abel's dead body in the pool. Yeah, man, the poor little shit doesn't even make it out of the original. So in this, it's very obvious that Patrick wanted Bjorn to find this to see what he'd do. He wants him to know what's coming and just to see if he'll actually do something. And once again, they're trying to leave in the middle of the night. Seems like they're being followed, but then their car breaks down on a back road. At this point, he still hasn't told them why they're escaping in the middle of the night. So he's just frantically trying to get help. But by the time he gets back to the car, they're gone. Turns out Patrick and Karen already picked them up, saying that Bjorn called them. And because they have no reason to think they're in danger, they believe that and got in. And Bjorn just goes along with it and gets in the car. We just want to go home. As long as you do as we say, it's going to be fine. I don't know, man. You got a whole ass room that suggests otherwise. I must stress, they probably have some kind of knives on them, but they don't have guns in this version. And from here out is where people got very annoyed. You know, like, why were there no Hail Mary plays? Why no escape plans? But that's the point. Their inaction is the point of all of this and why the original is working more in service of that theme, whereas the remake is interested in exploring those themes, but then also just kind of wants to follow the plot from like a point A to B, plug up some of those potential plot holes, like removing them having a support network in London so no one would 
really notice that they went missing, having Ant try to write a note and other things to get their attention, giving them firearms. But I gotta say, even in this scenario where you're like screaming at the screen for them to do something, there are plenty of people who would just freeze up and, and let horrible things happen to them and their loved ones because any choice can start feeling wrong or impossible or you are just literally so shell-shocked you can't. Patrick at one point literally gets out of the car to take a piss because he's so confident that Bjorn won't do anything and even though he looks at the keys and could just hop over there, he doesn't. So the car ride is super awkward because only half the vehicle knows what's going on. Like Agnes is literally asking where Ant is before Louise gets offended that Patrick is telling them to shut up. And this is where things get really rough. They've driven to a remote area where the babysitter is waiting and he holds Louise out of the way while they cut out Agnes's tongue. Yeah, I'm not showing it on screen, but they actually cut out her tongue. That is what we mean by brutal. That is what we mean by cruel. They cut off a kid's tongue in the original and he just lets it happen. Now I'm sure most parents at this point are like, holy shit. Shit, I wouldn't have let my kid get taken away even if I was just frozen in horror. Something would have to like click on in my brain. But that's not what Bjorn's supposed to be for this story. So after seeing Abel dead, all the other people they probably killed, seeing his kid's tongue cut out and then hauled away, Patrick saying, Why are you doing this? Because you let me. It's so much harder compared to the remake. It's still very good there, but here it feels so much more chilling because they've done so much more to this family. And then they just let themselves get driven away, which again, a lot of people are like, no, at this point, you just fight. You know your kid's there. You know what's gonna happen to your kid if you die. But no, they just get driven to a quarry. They have them stripped down. Then they pelt them to death with stones. That's so much more brutal than necessary. Oh my God. And just so frustrating when you just so badly want them to do something, but hell, it makes for a good watch, for me at least. And both are hopefully a cautionary tale to speak up for yourself while you still can. Speak that evil. The movie doesn't end here, though. Oh no, it is topped off with seeing Agnes in their back seat as they're driving to a new vacation spot to scope out future victims. Horrific! Literally the only way it could be worse is if it was expected that she was gonna be the replacement wife. So yeah, those third acts are completely different, and I do think you gain and lose things on each end. With the remake, you get the catharsis of them actually doing something, learning to take action once things hit their limit, which feels very accurate to a certain level of Western culture, you know, trying not to be rude before you hit the fuck it limit. But I understand why that annoyed people who just enjoyed the fact that the original is exploring a theme and is just following through to its execution and conclusion. The remake also cuts the teeth out of so much of that cruelty that set the original apart from a lot of other things in this category. It does try to swing around on the added horror that this man would gladly take an 11 year old as his new child bride, which is a lot more grim than just, you know, using her as a fake kid. Though there is a chance that in the original they were grooming all these kids to be complicit for trafficking and maybe Abel just didn't get a line enough for that to happen, but uh, they could just be killing them all. I suppose the remake just doesn't kind of leave you with that wide-eyed, like, holy shit, what did I just watch feeling the same way the original does? And even if in both it would be really easy to just, like, track down all these disappearances to this one couple, I do appreciate that the remake tried adding a few different things for logistics, like stealing their savings and like writing to their landlords to say that they'd be moving back to America. At the end of the day though, I just like that both of these exist and I like that they reflect on different aspects of social customs based on who's writing and directing them. That the remake tries to comment on the niceties and lifestyles the Daltons engage with being a little bit fake and largely for the image of being good people. Giving yourself a gold star because you made friends with a couple with a disabled kid. So I find that they both have value and make for interesting watches and even though I'd like the remake to have gone a little bit further somewhere, I do actually like that they switched things up enough to justify its existence. I didn't need a shot for shot more English version of a movie that was already pretty English. It's like a choose your own adventure and, and in the remake they chose the good ending or the as good as you can get ending. But let me know what you guys are thinking down below. Did you love them? Did you hate them? Do you like one and not the other? I know people making bad decisions in horror movies can be one of the most infuriating things in the world because I talk about that so much here but I think as long as you deliver something in the end that's entertaining you can get away with a lot. Like everyone in Abigail is dumb as hell, but that is a very fun movie. But that's gonna do it for today's video. Thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring the video, and thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. All my other social medias are listed down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.